All right, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for attending the Natural Gas Safety and the Use of GIS session. Um, my name is Caitlin, I will be your moderator today. Um, our speaker today is Mark Worth. Mark has more than 40 years of experience in the natural gas industry. Um, currently he works with Dominion Energy in their distributions and system integrity and damage prevention department. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Illinois and a reg registered engineer in Oklahoma and North Carolina. Um, Mark has asked that you guys feel free to put questions into the chat throughout today's session and I will uh, politely interject with some of those questions throughout or feel free to hold them to the end and we'll save about five minutes at the end to wrap back to questions. Um, Make sure that you have your name correct in your Zoom login so you get credit uh, for attending today's sessions. And just be aware, um, if you aren't already, we are being recorded. Um, and those things will be available on the conference um, after the event. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Mark and uh, have a good session, everybody. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um... I am probably the only one involved in this today that was born when there were only 48 stars on the flag. So um, keep that in mind. Anyway, yes, I work with Dominion Energy. Um, we were, I'm, it's not advancing for me. We had this problem before. There we go. Um, one, of the, one of the things I plan to cover, I plan to cover Dominion Energy natural gas, natural gas safety, and also how we are currently using GIS. You probably know more about that than I really do. Um, safety message first. Uh, one big safety item is communication. I'm getting tired of hearing about washing my hands, wearing my mask, though well, please wash your hands and wear, wear your mask. Um, but we come from different worlds here. Um, you're in a commuter, uh, computer world and I'm not. So, I'll say things that I take for granted. I'll use terms that I take for granted. And we need to watch that when we're in the field, field that we feel very comfortable in. Um, and the example I use here is kind of outside of that, but have you ever picked up a couch to move it and never had a discussion first to make sure who was gonna do what? Um, make sure we understand each other and what direction we're planning on going. Dominion Energy, you know, we were, um, PSNC, well, we were a public service company of North Carolina, then PSNC, then PSNC Energy. Now we're part of Dominion Energy, and we are Dominion Energy North Carolina. Dominion Energy is headquartered in Richmond, Virginia, and it is one of the largest energy providers in the United States. Um, Serve electric and um, in Virginia and in a little bit of North Carolina over by Roanoke Rapids. And we'll see in the next screen, we're talking about where we have natural gas facilities, but that's North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, um, Ohio, West Virginia. We don't have natural gas in Virginia, I'm sorry. Texas, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado. And this kind of fades in for us. Um, this, we still, there's my problem. We still do have a facility, is, we still own the system in Fort Hood, but we kind of, that's kind of under a different contract and we don't consider that within the distribution system. Looking at the state of North Carolina, um, th these are the areas that um, Dominion Energy North Carolina serves. As you can see, it's west near Asheville, uh, north of Charlotte, and then um, the Raleigh-Durham, the Triangle area. Just as an interesting fact, 42% of our customers now live in Wake County. That definitely was not true when I started here in 1990, but that's where we are today. And that just amazes me that that's, that's the way that county's grown. It's gonna be a good move, gonna be a good move for the employees and be a good move for the community for us to have moved from, moved to Dominion Energy. Uh, Dominion Energy has its core values. Let me bring them all up. Um, safety, uh, safety record is fantastic. The doing what's right ethics part, very much ingrained. Uh, Want to be best in class. Um, have seen changes, have seen where we plan on going and where we plan on going does take a lot of change. 
and um, we're one dominion. We want to be one set of employees. We don't want to be employees in Ohio and employees in Utah and things like that. We want to operate as one single energy company. Um, one of some of the stuff that Dominion has going on right now is um, solar, looking at adding um, like almost 16,000 megawatts of new solar energy in the next 15 years, currently operating about 2,200 megawatts. So really growing the solar business. We are um, <clears throat> looking at doing the best to um, reduce uh, carbon emissions, plan on being carbon neutral by 2050 trying to figure out the path to get there. Um, looking at solar and wind, we just talked about solar. Uh, wind, actually building these windmills off the coast of Virginia, far enough out there they are not visible from the shoreline. Uh, that is one of the big projects we have going on. Uh, converting the, the current coal generating facilities to uh, cleaner natural gas. We are using renewable natural gas. And that's the picture up on the right. We'll get to that in just a second. And um, trying to keep the nuclear uh, power plants uh, licensed, running for us all, and then um, drive uh, energy efficiency programs to our customers. We have a large project going out in Eastern North Carolina. We're with Smithfield Farms. And this is capturing hog and cow, methane from hog and cow manure to uh, produce usable, renewable natural gas. Now this starts with um, covering the system and gathering the, gathering the methane. We then uh, pipe that methane, some of it as much as 20 miles, to a processing plant where the impurities are taken out, it's converted to uh, methane that can be um, put into the distribution system and that will be being burned uh, at customers in North Carolina. We're looking at also other RNG um, opportunities in um, landfill and this is uh, the, uh, the cows. I believe that's in a different area of the company. Talking about natural gas, <clears throat> you've all heard natural gas. Natural gas isn't a singular beast. Natural gas is kind of a soup of gases. If you showed me a sample of, ga of, a, of the gas, I might not be able to tell you where it's from, but I can tell you where, it's, where it isn't from. Uh, just because it all has different levels of uh, methane, butane, propane, other, other hydrocarbons, some has nitrogen. Anyway, we try to keep, keep this down to where a standard cubic foot of natural gas is 1,000 BTUs. You might get 950, you might get 1,050 BTUs out of the natural gas that's actually entering your facility. But we do manage, we do build on BTUs, so we do adjustments for the BTU value of the natural gas. Properties of natural gas. Natural gas is lighter than air. You see that specific gravity of 0.6. Natural gas really wants to rise. So it's really trying to find the path of least resistance to, um, to get out of where, where it is. Um, it's colorless as produced. It's odorless as produced. It's non-toxic. You could breathe natural gas all day and the natural gas itself will not cause you any problems. Um, the ignition range for natural gas. Natural gas, the gas to air ratio is 5 to 15 percent. Um, five, under 5 percent, you just don't have enough to um, get the combustion, get the process going. At 15 percent, you're just oversaturated and you, once again, you can't get the reaction to happen. Now, the 1100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a pretty high temperature when you get to ignition of, uh, of any fuel. Uh, all of you remember uh, Kurt Vonnegut's book, of course, and his book was Fahrenheit 451. 451 being the combustion point of paper. So you can see that, um, that 1100 degrees is a pretty high temperature. And the most common cause of net gas ignition is an electronic spark. Um, 
we do uh, add mercaptan to our um, to our natural gas to give it that signature natural gas smell. It's got that rotten egg <clears throat> sulfur smell. Uh, I talk about the um, natural gas to air being five to fifteen percent. Mercaptan is noticeable at 0.5% natural gas. That's well below the combustion level. The problem that I see coming with this is my kids in their mid thirties have never smelt a rotten egg. My kids have not been around a lot of people that have smoked or that have struck cigarettes. So the concept of the signature rotten egg or sulfur smell, I'm not sure we're, how we're gonna explain that going forward. I said natural gas is non-toxic, but it does replace the air. So working near a natural gas leak can displace the oxygen. It can lead to dizziness, poor judgment, and lack of mobility. On um, olden day, before all the safety issues, I do know of employees while they were working to fix a gas leak that have passed out. And luckily there were gentlemen there to, uh, to remove them from the area and, and get them back with us. But um, it's, the safety has is, is really become amazing, but that's the biggest concern is natural gas will displace the oxygen. If natural gas is leaking in your house or wherever facility you're in, don't operate any electrical appliances. And that includes flipping a light switch. That includes ringing a doorbell. Those are things uh, that just, any of them cause that little electric spark. Please call 911 in Dominion Energy, North Carolina. I tell you, you will never remember that phone number. So you can either keep it with you or just remember calling 911. They'll get on scene. And if it's natural gas, they will make sure we are on scene. And please let us take care of the situation. I know my dad would try to fix it. Um, another safety issue is call 811 before you dig. Now, there's a lot more of us working from home. Um, NC811 has seen a lot more tickets entered by uh, homeowners this year. And uh, that's great. It's great that the message is getting out there. But if you're gonna plant something in your yard, plant a tree, um, really you're exempt from calling if you're digging less than 12 inches. But please, if you're gonna, if you're gonna plant something, understand that there are facilities in the ground, in your yard that could be less than 12 inches deep. And it's always just the safe thing to do. Um, we'll come out three full business days. So if you call on Monday, that locate request will be good on Friday and do that before you begin work. It might give you the opportunity just to find a different location to put the, put whatever you're putting in the ground. I've changed. I had plans on one nice pretty tulip bed that I had to move after they did the locate for me. I am rocking along here. I knew I could do that if I tried. Um, this gets to uh, the part of the presentation that you know more about it than I do. And that is, um, I'm a customer of the GIS system. I do distribution integrity management. I don't really, I really don't work with the GIS system. I don't understand that mystical world that provides me the answers. I am, um, right now in my car, you will find paper maps. I hate what I call the Betty Busey voice. And if you are a University of Illinois alumni from the 80s, 90s, 70s and 80s, you'd understand that voice. I don't have a Facebook account, a Twitter account, and I've got to figure out how to get the pictures off of my phone, onto the cloud, back to my computer before they replace my phone. I never remember how to do that. I'll let my clock ring. Uh, it's gonna ring a little bit. Um, not too long ago, this is the way forms were, this way the world operated for us. We did flow equations by hand we had um, the paper chart maps below where you see that could either be a consumption map or that could be a pressure map. Looking at the map from here, that looks like a consumption map. And we'd actually have integrators that would take that map and the pressure and would calculate the uh, volume of gas. Um, field report form right there in the middle. <clears throat> 
That's the form that the guys would fill out to get us the information. You see the top parts typed, but yes, that would have been typed in the office off of their notes. And you can see they did a, the drawing themselves out in the field. Um, let's just say if it was Friday, some of that information might not be as accurate as if it was on a Monday afternoon and they had plenty of time. But the industry was paper. In 1990, when I moved to North Carolina, we had what you call an atlas sheet, which is a big system map. And when we added gas lines, we just colored the street that the gas line was on. We didn't do, we didn't even show what side of the street the gas line was on for us to look at. So things have come a long way. Um, started moving to uh, the GIS platform in 1998. And that involved taking a lot of that paper and reading what the guys had on that paper and um, taking it and putting it into that GIS platform. Uh, a lot of work there. Uh, we are using a GE Small World in North Carolina. When we were purchased by Scana back in 2001, uh, Scana has been an Esri shop the whole time. We have um, had an issue, had the, uh, the plans to switch from Small World to Esri. And I believe this time we're actually gonna go through with it and it should be completed in uh, December, 2020. I shouldn't say this time, um, there were some pretty strong opinions in each side. And um, North Carolina really wanted to stay with Small World, but um, because of some of the other products we're looking at right now, we're finding the, um, the need and desire to move to, uh, to Esri. Um, the field guys, the field guys have been using a map frame in their vehicles. That is the mapping system that they've had available to them. And I can't believe it's from 2008. That seems like a long time ago now. And um, we do grab a lot of data from uh, this, like NC1 map. We get a lot of information for, there to help us build our GIS system. Now here's the cool stuff for, some, for me as a customer and for me looking back to the way things had been done in the past. Um, this feature manipulation engine, and I was supposed to just use FME because all of you know what FME is, but I didn't know. Um, we use this to do all of our risk analysis right now. Again, I'm in distribution risk, um, risk mitigation, and um, that just gives us so much better stuff. It's no longer me using a calculator to try to do system flow analysis. It's no longer trying to find an area, finding the address and going to a big filing cabinet full of uh, service cards and trying to pull out the right service card, the right last version of the service card and um, understand what was in the ground there. But this gives us easy access to the pipe age, the pipe condition, uh, pipe materials. Um, of course, we have, we've gotten the uh, floodplains, seismic, activities in the state, which we're lucky there is some, but not much. Urbanized and rural clustering, the population centers, this helps with some of our risk modeling. Landslide potential, um, luckily that has not come up greatly as a concern. Soil composition, different soils can affect our pipes differently. Um, right now, we are slightly more plastic pipe in the ground in our distribution system than we are steel. That's probably a 60-40 split right now. Started running plastic pipe really since I got here um, in the 90s, early 90s. They started running plastic pipe. The, a lot of the industry switched to plastic pipe in the 70s. Very conservative at PSNC Energy. So <clears throat> finally started using plastics. And all this right here, it lets us keep track of our materials. It lets us, if I want to know what plastic pipe of a certain type we installed in a given year, it can tell me where that pipe is. Whereas before, we'd have no idea. We'd, we'd have to start looking and hunting for that to go through records. And that can only become an issue if that pipe has a concern going forward. A lot of the data that we're collecting now, we're not collecting it for today. 
we're collecting it for risk analysis 30, 40 years from now. Um, our system in, in North Carolina is a very solid system. We've um, rebuilt, we got rid of all the cast iron, we got rid of all the bare steel. We did that during um, the 90s and early 2000s. So we don't have that. We've got cathodically protected. That's where you put a current onto the pipeline to, um, to actually protect it from rusting, corroding, and um, <clears throat> then we have plastic pipe. And that's, unfortunately, a lot of the industry can't say that, but everybody's pointing that direction. Everybody's going to get there. Mark, um, you're at about 10 minute warning right now. Thank you very much. Um, business districts. Business districts is an important thing. And five years ago, that was just the local office deciding where their business districts were. I hate to say this, um, but even as late as 2005, possibly, I looked at the maps for a different reason. And we didn't show any business districts in Brevard or Black Mountain. That was just those business districts were just decided by local, the local operations group, local management. And now using GIS, we can get the uh, impervious surface territories. And we can use that to help us determine where the business districts really are. That um, the impervious surface is a big sign. And unfortunately in Asheville, if you've been here for a while, that has been getting greater and greater every year. Now, I know one of the big issues is out there is why we do not share our GIS information. You know, as a local distribution company in LDC, uh, we, as most of the rest of the industry, we do not make our GIS information available. It's more safety driven than anything else. Remember all that paper that I showed you to begin with? That paper was used to build our GIS system. We are always finding things in the field, not a lot, but we do find, we do have opportunities to improve our mapping, let's put it that way. Um, you can still find the, the gas line on the other side of the street. Um, you can find it different location along that street right away. We're afraid that if we give out our information, this GIS information right now that that location in the GIS system might be taken as gospel and that people will not uh, call in locate requests and um, may cause um, unsafe excavations or other activities. When you call in NC811, we do get out there, we do locate our facility and um, that's a 24 inch tolerant zone each side of that, that facility, be it natural gas, be it your telephone line, cable line, whichever. So that's why we don't do it. Our GIS, our information is always changing. We're always adding to it. We rebuild pipe. We, um, it's, it's just that it's a changing, it changes. And we don't want it out there in, um, for people to believe that that's exactly what we have out in the field. If you are working on a given project, you can call NC811 and do a design locate. Um, for this, we will we'll come out and give you, we'll, we will give you a generic map showing the, showing which side of the road, basically, the gas line is on. This is to give you concepts for relocating. If you're relocating a sewer, maybe the gas line's going to get in the way. Maybe we need to discuss relocating the gas line. Maybe you need to discuss relocating the sewer. And this is usually with design firms that we're dealing with in, in the design locate tickets. And this right here, uh, you can't read the disclaimer that goes with it. Um, this is an old one since it says Public Service Company in North Carolina. But this is a generic system, what you're going to get as far as the um, system that we'll show you on a design locate. As you can tell, we don't give you dimensions. I am surprised that I see pipe sizes on this, to tell you the truth. Um, and that's for our distribution system. I should make that clear. That's the pipe in your neighborhood. That's the pipe around town. The pipe that connects 
to um, Williams Natural Gas, which is the only transporter of natural gas through the state of North Carolina. It runs from the Texas market to um, the Northeast. That's where all of our gas comes from right now. The lines that connect to that, those are transmission lines. Transmission lines, those are monitored by um, PHMSA, Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Association. That's a government agency. They restrict us from providing information on our transmission system. There is the um, National Pipeline Mapping System. There's a public viewer. Public viewer does not get much better than what I show in that picture. That will not get you, that'll get you an idea of what's in town, what's around you. There are different viewers available for government agencies and for pipeline operators that can dig deeper. <clears throat> and you can go to the NPMS to, uh, to get some more information, see what you'd like from there. And I believe that's my question slide. Any questions out there for me? Uh, so far, none in the chat. Please, everybody, go ahead and uh, start putting your questions in there. Uh, we've got one question. Um, why do gas utilities not share directly with municipalities? We have the same concern about locations. Wouldn't it help other utility members in the field to do their work better? I understand. And it, and it is an interesting thing where I can get mapping for the water system but we will not give napping system for the natural gas system. And it gets back to a safety concern. Um, it's just the material that we're dealing with, the fact that that map might be out of date. And um, like I say, if you're working on a project, we will work with you on the design locate for that project. But overall, that's company policy. And like I said, that's pretty much across the industry that we do not give out that type of mapping information but I understand the desire to have it. If I was on the other side of the fence, I would definitely want that information from the gas company. Um, next question here. How does your GIS system, um, or does your GIS system contain, contain information about the depth of pipes? Um, we don't maintain anything on depth of pipe. Uh, none of that was recorded. We can tell you where, how we are standard procedures in installing depth, but we can't swear to what's happened to the ground after we, after we put the pipe in the ground. So even on a locate ticket, we will not give you depth. There are, there's equipment out there that can be used to get a, an idea of what the depth of facilities are as far as locating. But again, <clears throat> that's something that we've never carried. We don't have that in our database. And because, and because the world changes, we just, we, just can't, um, we just can't supply that. And I've seen a, a situation where the state had been cleaning out a ditch and they're exempt to the original, original grade, but apparently they felt the original grade was about three feet lower at the, than at the time that we installed the gas line. And they were about 20 feet away from clearing out that ditch to, um, to get past the gas line. So we're lucky that we got by, that one of our guys drove by and saw what they were doing. But that's why we don't have depth because we really can't tell you how deep it is after we, after we leave the site. Normally, distribution lines are installed um, 30 to 36 inches deep. The service line from, the, from that gas main in the street to your house is normally installed between 18 inches and 24 inches but I can't tell you what type of grading happened in your yard the day after we left. So that's why. Um, next question here. Uh, when a, If a customer finds a correction to what they know about your GIS data, who's the best person to contact? Oh. We are, we are towards the end of our time, so. Right. One uh, that'd, be that phone number, that'd be that phone number I gave you. I know who it's gonna end up going to. Um, I really, it'd be the, I would, you know, the local operations guys, I would let one of them know. I would let our call center know that you had a concern and our guys, somebody from the company would be able to get back to you as far as that goes. But um, as far as giving, giving direct lines to um, any of the employees, uh, that's, I'm sorry. Anything yeah. else? 
Um, how do you generate reports um, from your GIS to meet regulation requirements or do you utilize your GIS for that? We use it. We've got an, an outside program, a leak damage failure program that the guys fill out the information in the field. That is actually one of the programs that feeds into our GIS system. It's more used to fill out our annual DOT reports. Um, as far as distribution integrity management, we're using the information that that shows to justify our risk ranking. So that's, you know, if we put in an equation as far as seismic activity along those lines, it direct, um, directly we don't use, we, we pull it out to use it for different, different ways, let's put it that way. Yeah, and one final comment in the chat related to, you know, when municipalities or the state does call you guys for uh, lo locating it for a particular project, um, just we typically do get the depth and location of potentially hundreds of feet of pipes. Um, we eventually, you know, collect that information. Um, so we do know some of it. So I guess the question oh, yeah. is, uh, what, Ha and this is something from my experience that I have a question on. Have you guys entertained um, MOUs or MOAs with local municipalities for that type of more broad data? data so first, you'd have to explain an MOU and an MOA to uh, me. <laughs> memorandum of understanding, basically a data sharing agreement that you would say to the municipality or the state, we trust you that you're not going to give this out to anybody and you'll still call us if you're going to locate something. Has that been considered at all? We haven't, as far as that, as far as that goes, like I say, if a design firm, even if you call in and you want that type of design level information on a design ticket, that's one thing, but we have not done any agreements with any municipalities to share data. And I do know municipalities that would really love us to do that. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we're a little bit over time here. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, Mark, thank you for your presentation. And um, please make sure to complete the exit poll as you end today um, to give us some feedback on the session. Okay. And remember, um, thanks, some, of us, some of us don't work from home. So uh, this has been quite a different situation for us. And we do need to get up out of our chair sometimes and make sure we take care of ourselves. So. Appreciate it. Hope I hope I did well for you guys and um, things are going well for you and your jobs. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you.